Welcome to Chronicles of Old Singapore. This is Dr. Lokes, and I speak to Singaporeans about their memories of Singapore before it became a global city. Very happy to have with us, uh, back on the show actually, uh, is uh, Maria Yap. Hello Ma Maria, morning, how are you? Hello, good morning. Yeah, Fine. that was a very, great. very quick yes, introduction. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the weather is better today, right? The, the last time there was like thunderstorms, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> Suddenly it got dark and then I have to put on the lights, remember? Yeah, <laughs> I thought we I could use a natural light, yes. A little crisis yeah. over there. Yes. Maria, of course, uh, was the guest in uh, the previous episode where we talked about Changi Village, where she lived. And just coincidentally, I found out that uh, uh, she was a long-time teacher, now retired. You know, I just thought I had to interview you, you know, about teaching. Uh, teaching is a real interest of mine. I was a former teacher myself. And uh, I always like to have teachers come onto the podcast to share their memories of teaching. I mean, teachers are not very well understood and often not appreciated enough in Singapore. Uh, we have had a couple of episodes from male teachers in the past. Uh, Kobun Long, uh, S. Kunalan, uh, James Kwok for a short while was a PE teacher. Uh, but this is the first time that we are speaking to someone uh, who can give us the female teacher's point of view. And as we know, uh, historically, the teaching profession uh, was largely a women's uh, profession. Right, so uh, very excited to hear about uh, your memories, uh, Maria. Yes, I joined teaching when I was 17, when I completed my A-levels. That was in 1973. Uh, I just want to go back a little bit uh, mm. about education. At that point in time, um, when we were seven, 17 we were, and we completed A-levels, we are considered some of, to be some of the elite people who have actually reached that level at yeah because singapore then was uh poor and struggling i think most people will not be able to appreciate that yeah and uh, i also would like to share something about psle everybody is so hung up about psle and so on and so forth and during my time in the 60s we already have psle and i and my cohort of people we actually took six subjects besides that English, maths, uh, science, and second language. We also have to sit for geography and history. I think those uh, really stood up in good state because I think this group of people, I mean, my contemporaries and those people, I think we, will be, I think we know a lot more besides being so uh, hung up about PSLE scores and results. We were, but we were we're not uptight. We know that after PSA, we'll just move on. Because those days, they, they really didn't have this thing that you have to score this, you will know that. We have no idea. Our parents have no idea. You know, we just pass your exams and then move on to secondary school. Of course, we know there were good schools, and but we didn't know how to get there and so on. And therefore, we have a, I must say, I have a very carefree uh, primary school education. I said, so, so did my friends, we didn't go for tuition, we were not so uptight. I don't blame the, the students and the parents nowadays because it's like, if you don't have this score, you can't go to this school. And somehow over the years, it's evolved to the point where going to an, a good school is so important. But if you ask me, I've taught in more than 10 schools from primary, secondary, uh, up to A-levels. and. Uh, like what is what the, the people have been saying, every school is a good school. What I'm trying to say is they have a point there, but people will say RI is good. But of course RI is a good school because the top students go there. You know, and then uh then the, the other schools like uh Hua Chong, uh those students score so well, of course. But then what I'm trying to say is that teachers are good, they're all trained by MOE. The teachers, in fact, in the in the mainstream school, I call it the mainstream school. Of course, the, the, the people understand it to be neighborhood schools. Um, they are really dedicated teachers. And they work with this cohort of students and they know what they need. And they work with them. Okay? Not everyone can have the caliber of an RI student. Therefore, they teach at different pace. So that's what they meant by every school is a good school. Because if it suits 
the the your profile and it will help you to grow. I have I have friends who uh, children went to St Hilda's is one of those so called elite schools, primary schools, St Hilda's, and the, the child was struggling. Then when she took her out, I put her in the neighborhood school, she was flourishing. Mm. See, yeah. So it really depends on uh, the child, how the child learns, what what their needs are, and the teachers are there to cater for this group of students. That's what they mean. Yeah. 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 yeah, I'm quite glad mm. you brought this up, you know, so maybe we can talk about this a little bit, right? I mean, this is not going to be a discussion on education. But, yes, 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 of uh, course, yeah. I mean, I'm not a parent, so I've never felt that uh, need to send my kids here or there. But I think my wife and I would probably fight over this, you know, <laughs> that uh, she she would try to get... Uh, the kid if we had one uh, into a convent school whereas I, I would be a, a bit more flexible about it but I do understand the issue that uh, a good school can give you an itch whereas if you go to a mainstream school as you said uh, you might fall into bad company or you, you might uh, not have the you know best environment to learn on the other hand as a teacher myself i also know that i taught in a you know njc which is a very good college and many of my students told me later on that they really struggled there they were not happy there uh, and they could have been happier in a, a, a jc that was not so competitive that was not so driven academically so i guess that's another side of it uh, how, how would you think uh, maria if you know, if a student goes to a mainstream school, what would be the best way for them to succeed? Would, would it be to get into the top class there? And then so you have a good class, right? So this would work under the old system, but maybe not so much now because they have the new uh, subject-based bending, right? How, how can the students uh, prepare themselves so that they can get the best education in a mainstream school? Okay. I hmm. came from mainstream school because that school is near my home. So I went to the girls' school then. I call it the mainstream school. Then subsequently, when I cleared my PSLE, one of the teachers who asked me if I would like to go to Kadung Convent. And those days, these are elite schools, you know, the mission schools. And uh, she wasn't sure whether I could go to a, a mission school because I come from mainstream school. Okay, I mean, I, I ordinary school. Yeah. And uh, uh, the the... Those days, they don't have vice prints. They have a senior assistant, the equivalent of a vice prince to say, oh, she can just apply. So I applied. She asked me to go. So I applied and I went there. I must say the mission schools then really have this environment of uh, speaking standard English. We have, uh, I have Irish nuns teaching us and so on. So it is the environment that encourages us to speak standard English. But if you ask me now, Okay, whether there is a great difference between these schools, okay, uh, I would say not, except for maybe the culture of the school. Because what you said about uh, your school in Changi Village, you know, brings me back to the previous podcast. Uh, and the other thing you said uh, during the, that podcast was that you were quite determined to study hard, right? Unlike some of your peers in the village, and you spent a lot of time reading and and studying. Uh, did you have a mindset then at the time in school that you wanted to be a teacher? Uh, no, I, I just wanted to, I just wanted to, I didn't even think of doing well. I just, I was, I, I love to be a student. I love to study. Yeah. And then I think it in my strike to sit for exams. And of course, I was quite fortunate that I, I did relatively well because actually my contemporaries, uh, my contemporary, of we graduated the class of O level graduated in 1970. My class, we have there were 44 of us, and nine of them were turned out to be uh, doctors in a class of 44 students. There was a class of 70. Then in a class of 72, when I went to JC, in my class, a small class of 30, we have about five doctors there. Good. Yeah. So I, I, I didn't think that I would want to do very well. I want to be, I, I'm just a naturally curious child. I enjoyed studying, I enjoyed, and therefore I paid attention a lot. And uh, I did a lot of things and I gave tuition to support myself. Yeah, I, I got some pocket money. So I, I gave tuition when I was in primary school to the primary ones 
and the parents and my neighbors give me some money to support myself all the way to A-levels. At A-levels, I had no choice because I need to earn for the family and therefore I didn't uh, apply to go to the uni. So I didn't have in mind that I wanted to be a teacher or whatever. Um, but when the time came, I, I chose to be a teacher because um, I like working with people. Yeah, so I applied to go to uh, Institute of Education, i.e. then. Yeah, it was TTC just trans transited and become Institute of Education in Patterson Road. Uh, when you were a student, you, you talked about your love of learning. Did you have uh, exceptional teachers? Do I have exceptional <laughs> teachers? I really cannot tell because I love all my teachers <laughs> until now. <laughs> you are the <laughs> perfect student. <laughs> I am 70, so I can remember all my teachers from really? primary one oh, gosh. all the way. And then those te days, the teachers were really, can I don't know whether I was special or not, but all the teachers have brought me to their home. Yes, all of them. All the way to primary six. The teachers have, have brought some of the students to their home. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> That's remarkable. <laughs> yes, yes, you can say that again. Uh, and there was a special teacher who even visited my home. She came and she visited my home and saw the condition that was living. Of course, I, was, I wasn't I was ashamed of my condition. I wasn't think. I know they have no money, but I never felt uh, sad or, or pitiful. Embarrassed, yeah. Embarrassed? No, I wasn't. Mm. Can you imagine when I was in sex? And I went to Kanon Convent. Those days, the girls in Kanon Convent, they were rich. They were chauffeur driven. And they all stay in Angmore too, you know, in big houses. Mm. You know, I brought 11 of them to my place where we don't have a toilet because there was a beach there. And I was, I just brought them there to my place to go to the beach. And we spent half a day in the beach. And then we go back. Then we just showered in whatever, in, in the make do bathroom that my mom find uh, in the end erected. And until now, my friends still talk about that time. So I have no sense of being awkward or embarrassed. Mm. I was so blessed. Yeah. Even though it, when I went to the house, I, was like, I told my mom, do you know in the, in the home, they have five toilets and the toilets are all the same color. I mean, different colors in, in different. And then it's, in the end of course, right now I know it's because there's actually not, that's a bungalow house in Tok Tolok Baku. It was a bungalow. So they have five rooms there and five rooms with attached bathrooms. Yeah. So I was blessed. I didn't feel, uh, I knew I, uh, I was poor, but I didn't feel, uh, I didn't have low self-esteem. That's why I wanted to say. But when I looked, when I reflected on it, I, I realized that I was very well loved throughout my whole school life, especially in primary school by my teachers, by my friends, by everyone else. And this love of learning is, is something we need, right, among our students more than anything else, more, more than, I would say, IT or policies or, you know, I mean, um, we're having discussions with friends recently about students using uh, the AI tools mm. to, to do their work for them, right? And that's become like a huge problem in education, in assessment. And to me, that's like, um, aren't these students interested in learning for themselves, right? Rather than just relying on a tool to canvas all the information for them. You know, s something seems to be missing, right? In terms of this love of learning. Um, yes, uh, that's, I, I, I was a very curious child. I remembered when I, mm. First, I was in primary three, we studied science. And when I discovered that there are male and female parts in the flowers, I was I went home and told my father, said, do you know? Of course, I spoke in, in Hakka, so I, I don't have those terms. The flowers, there are boys' flowers and girl flowers. And when I explained to my father what it meant. So to me, it was something, it was so like, wow, it was uh, an amazing fact to me. There's such a thing. But of course, right now, everything is... Everything is on out there for you to know. You don't really need to find out. Uh, and then I think it's also we we are so caught up with preparing our child for exams 
you look at the number of workbooks besides the homework that the school has already given. And if you go out, you see parents having the child doing homework when they're out. <laughs> so to me, it was so painful. I have a son in school. Um, I have never bought him a, a workbook, never, except mm. for one Chinese workbook from popular. I've never, after that, never, because I think they have enough homework and enough exercises for them to do without piling. No, you, you see the, the, the number of worksheets, the PSLE papers, they buy in, in stacks for the children to do. I think it's a very painful experience. It is like regurgitating facts and you are really not learning and, and, mm. uh, and that is the, 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 what I see. And on top of that, the amount of tuition the students have. I mean, over the years, when the parents can afford it, I've even seen students who have two tuition teachers for one subject. Sure. They go on separate wow. days. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I hope the parents listening to me, please give the child the time to be who he or she is and develop their interest in other areas. Exams are important. As long as they can move on, to go on to clear and then move to the next level, the next level. And, then, and once you reach uni, they will reach uni anyway, you know, uh, the, the, the interest will really carry them far. But if they study for the sake of studying, I've heard of students coming from RI and not many, but quite a few when they completed what they did, they just give up and don't want to study anymore. It's just yeah. that I have enough. Yeah. It, it is painful. Uh, painful for parents as well when they see their child just giving up after they have done so well because that's it uh, not many but now they talk about mental issues and we really have to know where our children are coming from what are the issues besides just looking at the exam results mm. Mm. they yeah. are important but you don't need them to be number one you don't have to be superlative you know they just need to be there that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Uh, Maria, so when you went to IE, uh, what uh, uh, teaching subjects were you given? Was, was, there, was this for primary education or was this for secondary? Uh, I, they call, they, they call, there were two groups of students, those who are university grads, so they, they are diploma holders, and ours are cert at a certificate in education. So I was A level student, so I, I went for the certificate in education course. Uh, basically, they teach you teaching uh, uh, skills. Make those days, you know, if we need, we need to, especially when you teach in primary school, we need a lot of teaching aids. They teach us how to make teaching aids and so on, rather than the content. The content was more or less there. We have already had it. So it's more that I want to share with you at that point in time when I was a training teacher, I was a part time training teacher. I need to earn. So I went to Mm -hmm. i.e. then in Patterson Road from 8 to 12 studying to be a teacher teaching a teacher's course and at 12 cook, take my lunch I rushed to school and started teaching at 1.40 there were afternoons there were, there were afternoon sessions then and then completed teaching at 6.30 black lowering go back and I have to take care of my students work I have to take care of my own work so it was when I look back I wonder how I did it. It was really very tiring. Uh, it's because I was 19 then. <laughs> you have a lot of energy and uh, you have a lot of passion. I think when with passion and energy can do a lot of things. So it was really very tiring. And it went on for three years. And mm. my pay was only 200 over then. And I didn't have any. But nowadays, the training teachers will have a cooperating teachers in school to guide them, uh, to be their mentor and, and but during my time, we had no, uh, we would have no uh, teachers assigned to us. The only person that was assigned to us was the supervisor from uh, IE then. Mm. And they just come to, to school, mm. observe your mm. lessons and give you feedback. But that, that really made me who I, I am as a teacher mm. later on. Yeah. I was a good teacher because of all these challenges and difficulties. You just do. Mm. So I'm just wondering, right? The first time you step into a classroom, do you remember that day? 
Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will share with you one experience. We were just thrown in the classrooms. We were not taught anything yet. I mean, concurrently, because we were having, I, I was sent to school in September. I, I went to IE in June. We give some uh, orientation and so on. And in September, we were sent to school already as a full-fledged teacher. I was even a form teacher. Uh, it, was, it was difficult. But one particular incident that I always remembered was I went to, I was a science teacher. So I brought my students to the science lab. And those days, science labs were huge. It was dark. And we had all the chemicals in on the bench. But nowadays, uh, all these chemicals are removed. The bench is just clean. Whatever the chemicals you need, it will be provided for you when you're doing the experiment. Those days, all the chemicals were stacked up. We have all the acids and all the alkalis and everything all stacked up in front of us. I don't know whether you remember. You know, it, was, it was like that. And I couldn't control the class. Seriously, I couldn't. And one of the students, after the, after, the, after the lesson, she came to me and very quietly told me, Je, je, the boys pour the chemicals away and put that water inside. I tell you, it was it was a shock to me. And she couldn't tell me who, and she didn't want to tell me who. So when I went back to the staff room, I sat there. And those days, the staff room, you have one table shared by four teachers, one big table shared by four teachers. We don't have an individual table to ourselves. So I sat there, and I was hyperventilating, thinking, how, what am I going to do when my supervisor come? And then I fellow teacher trade. Uh, teacher trainers there, not not teacher, I mean teacher trainees there, my 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 co mm. colleagues. And they said, what happened when when your supervisor come? And I tell you, I the tears just came down and I cried, you know. I cried also. It was, I was just overwhelmed. So that was my I remember that very well. But subsequently I was uh I think I was a good disciplinarian. I didn't have problems here. Because I, looking back, I now I realize that you have to think, you have to put yourself in the shoes of a student and think like them and see what they want. And therefore, you relate to them from that point of view instead of being like scolding them and, and saying, you do this, you do that, and so on. You, you, you just have to work with them. Mm -hmm. I remember, um, this, is, this is funny, yeah? I remember seeing my colleague, he was a Sikh. He, has, he, he had blue eyes. And uh, I walked past his class and his, the students were so quiet and he was seated at the, at the teacher's bench and the class was very quiet. I said, when I saw him, I said, Mr. Singh, how do you control the class? He said, because of y'all. You know, I just sat there, fold my, folded my arms and tell them, I am a Bengali Singh group. Better watch out. So the students are all very frightened. <laughs> yeah, but our parents used to frighten us with Bengali Singh, the police, uh, you know. Uh, therefore, we were, as children, we were very frightened. I think, yeah, he said that to them. And, you yeah, know, his class was always very well behaved. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. So it, to me, it was very, I always remember this, yeah. I, I just want to ask you, right? You say, to, to, to see it from the student's point of view in terms of discipline, could you give an example? Uh, okay, with this incident where I was a very young teacher and then the students those days, they used vulgarities in Hokkien and they used the uh, F word in Hokkien and I happened to hear it and I stopped teaching immediately. I said, who said what? I just said that. I in the first place, they didn't, they, they didn't expect me to say it. And, and I just continue to say that, you know that you're insulting your mother? Mm -hmm. I was a science teacher then. Uh, I, saying, I said, do you know where you come from? Do you know you're insulting your mother, your grandmother, your sisters, and your future wife? I never hear any vulgarities in the class. Uh, what I'm trying to say, I, I didn't pick up the students and scold him right there and then. So I embarrassed him. Mm. I just said this very quietly, very quietly. I didn't even shout or scream. And I very quietly and firmly said that to them. Uh, another time, one child was crying and she was crying very, very badly. And uh, I wanted to talk to her and 
and she didn't want to talk. So I, I let her I let her sit there and cry. And after that, I went to her quietly after lesson and brought her out and said, Do you want to speak to someone? Okay, if you don't want to speak to me, you can speak to this teacher who is a counselor. You know, and she just cried. And then she 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 just kept quiet. And subsequently after school, she came to look for me. So I do not so sometimes we do not just question that and then then try to 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 mm. take over, you know, and and insist on on wanting to have the answer there and then, yeah. So you give the students the space and yeah, give them the time. I'm just wondering where does your inner resource, right, your ability to deal with these issues. Where does that come from? Was that something that was taught to you? Or was that something you kind of just figure out from your own uh, personality and values? I think it's my personality and values. I, mm. I do things uh, I, I, I do things to others by uh, you know, do unto others what you want others to do unto you. Do not do unto others what you do not want others to do. And that's how I also handle my parents and subsequently, I became a, a head, head of department. We have to see parents. Uh, then the vice principal, we see parents a lot. I always put myself in the shoes of the parents. If, you know, if I'm handling this child, what do I want the school to do for this child? So I put myself in the shoes of the parent. Seeing where they are coming from, what they, they want. And from there, then I, I work out things with them. Of course, uh, when I deal with parents, they are angry parents because only when cases are challenging, they refer them to us. So I'm very mindful of that. Yeah. So I think that was my, that's how I, de I deal with things. It's something that I, it's me and uh, I find that it works. And uh, when the discipline master come and say, how do I deal with this and that, and that I said, I will give them certain uh, under underlying principles. Huh? I said, if the parents are very angry, just focus on the child. Say, that, okay, okay, what do you want us to do? Okay, I'll share with you what the school knows about the child. Let's see what we can do to help the child together. Mm. Okay? So when you go along that line, the parents cannot get angrier and angrier. But I must say that in, in the schools that I went to, I, I was very uh, fortunate that the school leaders always front the challenging situations. Okay? We are always there with the teacher and we front it. And I have told my teacher that if parents get very, very angry, I would just say, uh, oh, this, the class is waiting for you. You go, you go. Because I'm the third, I'm third party, no matter how angry the parents are. But the, the, if the teacher is the one who, who has caused such issues or whatever, and the parents cannot back down or whatever, and then I will have to let the teachers go first and then discuss with the parents. Mm. Of course, sometimes it's really the fault of teachers. By and large, it's always a misunderstanding. And of course, uh, parents always listen to their children and children will have misconception of how the teachers have handled the case. That's true, yeah. Mm. Uh, I just want to ask you, uh, and this came up uh, in my discussion with uh, Ko Wen Long, right? Uh, I mean, he was... Uh, very passionate talking about the, the issue of streaming, the policy of streaming, which he was opposed to, right? I just want to ask you if, you know, you had uh, taught uh, normal students before, normal tech or normal acad academic, and uh, did you have uh, difficulty dealing with normal students? Okay. Talking about streaming, I'm also very passionate yeah. about it. I, yeah. I, I, I want to go back to this thing about MT1, MT2, MT3. Remember those? primary school, mm. mother tongue, MT1 mm. and I. It is a very, very painful experience. And I always felt that we are too strict in streaming students. For example, if you want to do mother tongue at level, at higher mother, okay, higher, higher mother tongue, okay? You want to do it higher mother tongue, you do standard mother tongue. And then after that, uh, watered down for the mother for for the, for the MT three, but there are many students who come from dialect speaking home. All the other subjects they may not do well. They may not do well in maths. They may not do well in science, and they may not do well in 
but based on their average students. But if you're average students, if you do not get into MT1, you cannot do higher Chinese or higher Malay, which is a very sad thing because these students are really good in this. And in order to have some self-esteem, you must be good in some subject, but they are not allowed to do it because you are not in MT1. The streaming is the MT1, you, you need to score how many, you have to do well in how many subjects, you need to score a certain standard. Then when you end up in the class, you can handle higher mother tongue. But then I must say that those students who did well in the other three subjects may be struggling with the higher mother tongue, especially in the Singapore context, because it doesn't matter whether or not you are good in your Chinese. Okay, as long as you're Chinese, you have to do Chinese, which to me was something we shouldn't have pushed through so hard because when I was in Kanon Convent, my classmates out of the 44 of us, one third of them were doing Malay. Another one third were doing normal, uh, are doing Chinese. And then we have one small group of us doing higher mother tongue. They, they call it higher Chinese then. But many of my classmates, they were Chinese and they did uh, Malay, and they all scored distinctions. But why can't, why didn't, I don't know why they were not flexible enough to allow second language to be one of our major official languages. And because of that, I think, I think that's my perception. We lost Juni Seng, Elaine Seng, do you know that? You heard of them? They were our swimmers, mm. our national swimmers. They, they were uh, the pet chan, the, the much younger. We lost them because they need to have mother tongue in order to go to the university. So I think Mr. Sung Chen Ket, and I told her, I did talk to him. The whole family migrated. And uh, I think we lost quite a number of Peranakan and English speaking families then because of the mother tongue issue. Yeah. They could have allowed them to do Malay. I mean, we need Malay anyway. Yeah. So, um, and did, did I teach normal academic? Yes. Mm. They introduced this in 1981. Uh, okay, I think I must put a caveat here because um, streaming, do you know that we used to take five years to complete our secondary education? Apparently, I, I hear, I hear. I have, I try to read up uh, to prepare for this podcast find information on this. We use the file, it's just like the, the Malaysian, they have form three, then form two, and complete that. We had five years to complete the, the secondary education, but subsequently we need people to go into the workforce and therefore they reduce the secondary education from five years to four years. When we had that, the attrition rate was quite high. The number of people who couldn't clear was quite high. And therefore they introduced the five years they re, they reintroduce the five five years thing, and therefore, the four years is called express stream. The five mm -hmm. years is called normal, and actually, the normal students are absolutely they were as clever or as good as express stream, except in terms of behavior wise, in terms of study attitude and so on, they were not as good. Okay, of course, once you talk call them normal academic, they also behave. They partly they were. Well, quite rascally in the comments. And then they also, you know, giving them this label. We, for once, I realized that when they introduce the discipline issues in school, went up quite a, quite a bit. Because suddenly we have these normal academic students and then they, they, they behave differently. You label them, they behave differently. But when they were spread across, uh, yeah. I didn't have any issues because I started teaching in 1973. Yeah, we didn't have such issues, but when they introduced the normal academy stream, we had issues like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, what I wanted to say that because they introduced the normal academy stream, many of the students were able to, com more students were able to complete their secondary education. I don't have the, the data for that, but more could, but the labeling didn't help. Because once you label this, the students just feel, uh, have, a, have a lower self-esteem and then the normal tech even worse. Yeah. And I realized that the normal tech students from primary school, 
they are those who are hyperactive. They could not sit down. So mm. it's difficult for them. And they are very intelligent. Because I met quite a few of them and never expected them to be normal, normal tech. Yeah. But they ended up because they, they really couldn't sit down and pay attention. I wish that when we had those streaming years, we also prepared the teachers to teach them in a different way and give them different kind of support. Like what we are doing now, ITE, I think it's quite a wonderful thing that we have this group of students who they cater to this group of students who learn differently. You know, and and the intelligence is also quite different from the others. It's not academic. It's not words. You know, yeah. Mm. So we lost yeah. quite a few people there. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's taken more than forty years, right, for the um, streaming to be kind of brought back, and now we we have this uh, subject based banding. Do you think this is the right move? Oh, definitely, mm. definitely. Because we we are we are not good in everything. We are good in something, and whatever we are good in, it actually brings uh, up our self esteem, and it will then rub off on the other areas. Otherwise, we will feel small in all areas, and because we feel small, we lose self. It just affects every area of our life. You know, not only talking about uh, learning and exams. But other areas, because you know how how Chinese parents been go for Chinese New Year. Hey, yeah, uh, MT three ah, so hey, all the heights the MT one, you know that kind of thing. Mm. And then the child feels so small, poor thing, you know, really. Yeah, how we talk about our students, yeah, our children. That's I right. mean, you know, yeah, that's right. Mm. Uh, I want to ask you, uh, when you joined uh, the teaching service in seventy three. What was uh, the message from the ministry, from the government, in terms of the role of education, right, for Singapore? Those days, uh, hardly any kind of communication. Everything is in school. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it really. We we were we they were. And subsequently, with all the 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 internet, and we have more. I will share with you one funny story. Eh? Mm. My. One of my principals, she was working in. After she she went for a course, and when she completed, she was posted to MOE to, to support a, a project, and she was working with a director. And then she she was telling me about it. See, then my director came. It was so funny. The DS came to speak to him, and I was wondering how come this DS, deputy secretary, the way she speaks and so on is like. Quite different, huh? How come the deputy secretary can talk to my director like that, not knowing that the deputy secretary is one level below our set? <laughs> we didn't know, and that was quite recent. Huh? that was in the nineteen. I joined the school in nineteen ninety six. Ah, in nineteen ninety six, nineteen ninety. It means in nineteen ninety five. We did. We didn't know about this hierarchy. Yeah, communication was also not so much, but subsequently they step. They step up. Yeah, and because they step up all this communication and the expectations they have on school, they also give us a lot of support in terms of personnel and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, did you get a sense, like as a teacher, you you are to mold these students, you know, into future citizens of Singapore who could contribute to the Singapore society and economy? You know, oh, was yes, there yes. that kind of awareness? Uh, when I first started teaching, is helping students to pass as many of them to pass exams. And those days, we don't even. I mean, if they did analyze the results of the school, we didn't know because our par our principals had never shared. Okay, or maybe it was, but apparently it was already there. But subsequently, uh, all this came in, and they they did communicate, and we were very aware. And I think Go King Sui did a quite a good thing in attracting. Uh, promising uh, teachers, uh, high ability, because he revised the salary twice, mm. upwards and quite a bit. So he attracted quite a few things. That was one thing. The other one was they introduced uh, courses for teachers. It really helped us because otherwise we're just teachers for life. We just teach and then we just, then we have courses to help us to upgrade new, new findings, new teachings, you know, new, um, so, and support us in our curriculum and teaching. So, that came mm. in quite a lot. 